On New Year's Day of 2003, 20 years ago to this day, the second episode of Chased by Dinosaurs, Land of Giants, was released. Not to be confused with the third episode of Walking with Beasts by the same name, Land of Giants is the second Walking with Dinosaurs special to star Nigel Marvin as live action presenter, known internationally as Chased by Dinosaurs. I already went over what makes these episodes unique compared to the original series in my review of The Giant Claw, so be sure to watch that video first before this one. Without further ado, let's get into Land of Giants. Now, I don't want to start this review off too negatively, but Land of Giants is kind of a mess scientifically. The Walking With series has always been a bit loose when it comes to the dates and locations of its starring creatures, Giant of the Skies being a particularly bad offender. Land of Giants, however, might just be the most egregious of the entire series in this regard. This special is set 100 million years ago in mid-Cretaceous Argentina. Out of the five animals featured, none of them lived during this time. At least not 100 million years ago specifically, as some do come very close that I'm willing to overlook. Nigel states that the goal for this safari is to see the biggest predator of all time, Giganotosaurus, hunt the biggest prey of all time, Argentinosaurus. Now, I'm sure there isn't a single thing about what I just said that didn't annoy hardcore paleo enthusiasts. The title of Biggest Predator, at least on land, currently goes to Spinosaurus, though of course theories on Spinosaurus's aquatic affinities change by the week at this point, so who knows. The title of Biggest Herbivore is also up for debate, with Argentinosaurus being only one of several contenders of enormous sauropods vying for top spot. As far as I know, despite being known from so few remains, Argentinosaurus does still hold the title as all the bones we do have that can be compared directly to other genera, Argentinosauruses are bigger, if only by mere centimetres in the case of the diameter of its vertebrae. It is also quite difficult for one animal to hunt another when they didn't live together. To elaborate on this, neither Giganotosaurus nor Argentinosaurus lived exactly 100 million years ago. Barely. Giga lived about 99 million years ago at the earliest, to 95 million at the latest. Argentinosaurus lived from 96 million years ago at the earliest, to 92 million at the latest. So whilst there may be some overlap of the two in terms of time, the two are known from different geological formations. Giganotosaurus is known from the older Candeleros formation, whereas Argentinosaurus is from the slightly younger Huincor formation. Unless there was some faunal overlap between the two formations, it's possible these two genera never encountered one another. And now to make the picture even more confusing, at the time Land of Giants was being produced, remains of a very large theropod from the Huincor formation had been assigned to Giganotosaurus. However, in 2006, these were assigned to a new genus, Mapusaurus. Mapusaurus did actually live alongside Argentinosaurus, albeit later than 100 million years ago. So I suppose we can assume the Giganotosaurus featured here should now be referred to as Mapusaurus. And just to add the cherry on top of this confusion Sunday, the Giganotosaurus model bears a stronger resemblance to a third genus of giant theropod from Argentina called Moraxes that was discovered in 2012 but wasn't named until 2022. It was also discovered in the Huincol formation along with Mapusaurus and Argentinosaurus and had crests over its eyes quite similar to the Giga here. Seemingly by sheer coincidence as it wasn't known about until long after production had ended. <sighs> Just to point out how weird Land of Giants is to talk about, I'm already an entire page into the script for this video, and I haven't even gotten to the actual plot yet. So without further ado, let's do just that. The special starts out with Nigel driving to his camp across the volcanic landscapes of mid-Cretaceous Argentina. The special was filmed on the beautiful La Palma, one of the Spanish Canary Islands off the coast of North Africa. This was the first of many times this location would be used as backdrops for CGI-based paleo docs. 
We then see the giant skeleton of an adult Argentinosaurus, and it's a magnificent prop that really helps you grasp the scale of these animals before seeing a live one. We then see Nigel head down to a lakeside, where he foreshadows that the area will soon be populated with huge dinosaurs. We then see him uncovering old nests and explains that this area is the perfect nursery. My issue is that he never explains why. My best guess would be that there's plenty of food and water for the hatchlings, but I don't know. We then see a live young Argentinosaurus, and I don't really like the model. Both the juvenile and adult Argentinosaurus suffer from having really weird proportions that were based on Saltosaurus, like many poorly known titanosaurs were at the time. However, more recent studies have shown that Saltosaurus actually had quite unusual proportions compared to most titanosaurs. As a result, the Argentinosaurus here are very leggy and their heads just look off. We don't have any cranial material for Argentinosaurus, but based on other titanosaurs, the head seems really big in proportion to the neck, as well as maybe being too tall. The posture is also outdated. Recent studies have shown that the sacral vertebrae of sauropods, which are the vertebrae over the hips, are positioned in a way that angles the front of the animal upwards. As a result, the shoulders should be higher than the hips. Sauropods are also now believed to have held their necks in a more vertical position than is seen here. My personal taste aside, for the time it looks fine, but it hasn't aged well. Whilst Nigel stares awestruck at the young dinosaur, he is caught unawares by the giant crocodile-like Sarcosuchus. Like all the other creatures in the special, it did not live 100 million years ago. It lived from 132 to 112 million years ago, so would have been extinct by this time. Not only that, Sarcosuchus is not even known from Argentina. The earlier species, Sarcosuchus hartii, lived in Brazil, and the later species, S. imperator, lived in Nigeria. Its saving grace, however, is that both the CGI model and animatronic head are flawless. As far as I can tell, it is perfect in terms of accuracy, and it looks great and naturalistic too. Just a shame it's a bit lost in time and space. After Nigel recovers from his near-death experience with the incredible reaction of Flippin' heck. We then get a really cool scene of him luring the Sarcosuchus back to shore with the vibrations of splashing a stick in the water, like with modern crocodilians. It works, and Nigel decides to use a head cam to look inside of its mouth while it's basking. Luckily he comes to his senses when the Sarcosuchus snaps down on the stick and just barely misses Nigel. Later, we see Nigel searching for a herd of adult Argentinosaurus, but instead he finds... Ugh, where do I start with these things? Well, I guess I'll start with the fact that the model is the exact same one used in the BBC's version of The Lost World, released in 2001, whose visual effects were also done by Framestore. Throughout the special, Nigel switches between referring to these animals as Iguanodon and Iguanodonts. The genus Iguanodon was for many years a wastebasket taxon that many ornithopod dinosaurs similar to Iguanodon were lumped into. In more recent years, the defining characteristics of Iguanodon have become much stricter and many species were reassigned to their own genera, many of which were members of the more inclusive group Iguanodontia. Many fans have labelled this animal Macrogryphosaurus, an ornithopod from Lake Cretaceous, Argentina that was discovered in 1999 but wasn't named until after production had ended in 2007. I'm hesitant to jump on this bandwagon as Macrogryphosaurus lived after the setting of this special around 93 million years ago and it seems to be fully bipedal, whereas the animal shown here is a facultative biped. Macrogryphosaurus is also no longer considered an iguanodont, as it is now considered an elasmarian, or elasmarian? A separate group of ornithopods to the iguanodonts, native to Gondwana. There are unnamed iguanodonts known from both the previously mentioned Candeleros and Huincol formations, so I'm personally more inclined to believe these are what this animal is meant to represent. All this to say, I can't say anything about its accuracy, as it is literally just an iguanodon model that fits a role in the story. 
In his search for the Argentinosaurus herd, Nigel heads all the way to the coast. Here we are introduced to another creature who's represented by a reused model from the BBC's The Lost World, Pteranodon. Oh boy, there's unfortunately quite a bit wrong and outdated here. For starters, Pteranodon lived in North America 85 million years ago, so wrong place and time again. It also suffers from the many outdated ideas about pterosaurs that the original series had too. Their wingtips are pointed when they should be round, their wings fold the wrong way while standing, they completely lack pycnofibers, and Nigel also claims that they rely on updrafts to take off which is now believed to be untrue and that they could instead take off using their powerful forelimbs. I am glad they show it as a coastal animal and explain that their bodies are designed to be lightweight for flight. They are portrayed here as skim feeders, whereas more recent research indicates that they would dive and swim after prey like modern gannets. Its inclusion feels really weird to me, as if they wanted to reuse a pterosaur model, why not use the Ornithochirus model and repurpose it slightly into another type of similar pterosaur that were known from South America at the time? The Ornithochirus even makes a cameo later, so they clearly had it on hand but chose not to use it in that way. Oh, and they also didn't cut out the part where you literally see the fish Nigel throws in the air that the Pteranodon supposedly catches, land and make a splash in the water. Come on, guys. Later that night, we see that Nigel's camp has been raided by a large predator, leaving behind a huge tooth. I like that Nigel then teaches us that theropods would regrow their teeth like sharks and alligators. It's honestly a kind of spooky moment. The next morning, after showing us his trusty dinosaur scaring bike horn again, Nigel tracks the predator that attacked his camp by following its footprints. It's cool and insightful knowledge for animal tracking and works well as foreshadowing as he explains how he can tell from the footprints that the animal's behaviour changes partway along the trackway, speculating that it may be stalking something. Nigel then hears the unmistakable sound of another tremendous kerfuffle as the camera pans to a lone iguana dance running away. As Nigel approaches to investigate, he finds a trail of blood flowing down a small creek, leading to a wounded iguanodon. He then finds more and more blood spatters until coming across a giganotosaurus with a dead iguanodon. This is by far my favourite scene from Land of Giants. The tension and build-up whilst also being informative is just wonderful. As for the Giganotosaurus model, as I said earlier, it may represent Mapusaurus, despite bearing a stronger resemblance now to Moraxes with its slightly over-exaggerated head crests. The head is quite shrink-wrapped and not quite the right shape. The end of the snout should be slightly steeper than is shown here. The wrists are also pronated like many theropods in the series. Overall though, I love the design and coloration. In the next scene, we see Nigel flying an ultralight alongside Pteranodons, as well as a cameo by the Ornithochirus. And yep, you guessed it, wrong place and wrong time. Nigel then finally finds the herd of Argentinosaurus, and I swear this one on the right gets hit in the face by the ultralight. There's also this awesome shot of the herd in front of this giant cloud over the hills in the distance. Great stuff. Once Nigel lands and catches up to the herd in his jeep, in another cool scene, we see him lay out lorry weighing pads in front of the herd to weigh one of the adults. 92 tons is a reasonable estimate, but most modern estimate range is closer to 80 tons. But of course, mass is now impossible to tell from only bones. Nigel then foreshadows that the herd will soon be entering the most dangerous part of their migration. The next day, on his way to intercept the herd, Nigel spots an iguanodont running alongside him in the jeep, before briefly being chased by Giganotosaurus himself. Upon reaching the herd, Nigel finds several Giganotosaurus have targeted and are very slowly wearing down a young female Argentinosaurus. The way they're animated stalking the herd is really intimidating and so well done. They have such a menacing presence to them. The hunt goes on long into the night until presumably the Argentinosaurus succumbs to the predators. The next morning, we get another cool shot of the herd before seeing the story end on a light-hearted note, seeing the mother Argentinosaurs laying their eggs by the lakeside as the credits roll. Interestingly, they are shown squatting rather than having an egg tube thing that Diplodocus had in Time of the Titans. Oh yeah, and then the Sarcsuchus attacks and it ends. 
I feel like I've been quite negative in this review, but truth be told, I really enjoy Land of Giants. It's just such a scientific mess that I feel it is enjoyed far less on review than on watching, as it is a really fun time. I feel that of the two Chased by Dinosaurs episodes, the Giant Claw is the superior product overall, and feels like it had more love and care put into it. Land of Giants, on the other hand, feels a bit rushed what with the reused models and wonky science, even by walking with standards. I felt like I was seeing a lot of cut corners while watching it, which was a shame, as there is some brilliant stuff in here. Overall though, whilst it's not my favourite entry in the Walking With series, I thoroughly enjoyed Chased by Dinosaurs, and it paved the way for Sea Monsters and Prehistoric Park. Thank you so much for watching, bye bye now.